found last year and uh, of course I'm very happy to be with you uh, this year. Um, my talk is mainly uh, for me uh, an occasion to discuss with us uh, with you and uh, about the, the question of skill learning and try to increase the, the distinction between the two notions and perhaps precise each other. Um, and as you see in the subtitle, uh, my talk is a sort of uh, dialogue with Craig uh, and with John and of course uh, many other uh, and of course with you. Um, and um, The idea of this talk uh, comes from uh, the reading of the Craig chapter. Uh, I hope that the date is okay. Uh, but the, the first sentence of the chapter, which, which is on the website, and uh, you can read it, of course. Uh, the first sentence is, skill acquisition is a specific form of learning. And uh, I'm intriguing by this uh, sentence uh, because in a, a document uh, which I've written, I've, uh, I, 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 um, I write, um, learning is a specific form of transformation. And I've the, a strange feeling when I read the, the phrase, uh, the sentence, uh, a strange feeling of uh, something like um, Russian puppet. Hmm? And, uh, my idea is to consider that, okay, Craig speak about uh, skill as a specific form of learning, and I try to speak about learning as a meta-category. And perhaps if I try to define this meta-category, the definition of skill could be modified or conserved, I don't know. Okay? So, And I've noted uh, the main point you, you have written in your paper. And uh, the first point is that uh, skill behavior uh, is not just an overt behavior and can concern um, cognitive processes with, uh, which are judged higher uh, and concern uh, symbolic activity, for instance. Uh, the second one is that uh, skill behavior implies repetition for learning and uh, we have speak about but the question of repetition is something I think very important because uh, repetition doesn't necessarily um, means uh, the same behavior. Re repetition is something uh, which appears uh, to be uh, something like uh, a derivation not something uh, I identical or similar. The third skill is that uh, when the skill behavior is reliable, is uh, easy to retrieve and don't reliable. Um, this point, of course, is very important. It can be routinized and or automatized, and that point, uh, of course is important because he indicates a change of uh, conscious status of the activity. And uh, I think this question is clearly not uh, well managed today. <laughs> and uh, you have a, a suggestion uh, which consists to say that all skilled behavior appears as responses that are not innate. Okay. Many of you uh, knows that, uh, know that um, our work in, uh, in Compiègne University is mainly inspired by the work of uh, Paul Bakirita on uh, tactile vision sensory substitution uh, was uh, lead, uh, led his main uh, research 
during uh, the from the end of 60s until the the end of the 20 20th cycle and um, the two main results uh, of Bakirita are of course very important uh, the first one is to evidence that per se, per se, um, everybody knows this type of technology mm, yeah someone don't know don't know at all okay so the first point is that uh, perception with this type of technology implies that uh, the people produce movement but the point is that the movement must be an adjunctive movement the movement has to be produced by the agent and at this moment the agent had, has the possibility to perceive form complex form and more importantly complex form which are perceived out there so the perception is not at the surface of the sensor for instance the, the skin or the retina or you can imagine all all of them but the perception is not on the surface of the sensor but out there and in line of this work we have developed a platform which is called Tactos and probably Loic you will have the opportunity to try if you want you have developed uh, a platform which is called Tactos uh, the principle of this platform is very simple you have the opportunity to manipulate for instance a pen on the surface of a graphic tablet and when you move as the camera of Bakirita when you move the pen in the computer you manipulate something like a pointer which can be a sort of virtual retina and you can define the property of this virtual retina and when this retina cross an object a virtual object digital object in the computer you are in the same in a certain sense in form of its presence by a tactile signals which is delivered by uh, bright cells and electronic bright cells okay so it's important to consider that the electronic bright cells uh, doesn't deliver bright code it's just uh, a technology to deliver a tactile signal okay And of course, as in the Bakirita situation, the question of perception is not just on the graphic tablet, just on the sensor, but in the loop. Okay? And of course, when you lead experiments with this type of technology, we really appreciate what uh, Charles called uh, the prismatic effect of the technology because you are able to manipulate many dimensions in the loop and predict some effect on the phenomenological constitution of the agent related to uh, object in the virtual world for instance So we call this type of technology minimalist because you understand that the tactile stimulator doesn't indicate in one way the form. To have the experience of the form, you have to 
explore it, and at each moment of the time, you have a signal or not, and if you have a signal, that indicates the presence of the form, and just locally, okay? So imagine that you have to explore visually the world instead uh, of the 126 uh, uh, million of photoreceptor, you have just one in your retina, okay? If you have just one photoreceptor in your retina, probably uh, you have difficulty to perceive the environment, but it's not impossible. The counterpart to perceive something in out there is to produce a very active pattern to explore the, probably the, the discontinuity which are present in the environment. But the logic of tactos is something like that. You have to produce the gesture of the form to experience it, okay? And of course, you can manipulate, for instance, if you imagine that uh, it's not a pen on a graphic tablet, but, uh, but uh, a trackball, for instance, or a mouse or something. Of course, each space you constitute with this type of technology is different. The space you leave when you explore the space with a mouse or with a pen is really different. That's important, okay? So the, di the dynamic which is impulse in the, in the loop, of course, can be, can be modulated by any part of the, any when, we, when you manipulate any element in the loop, the form of the, the virtual retina, the mean you have to uh, explore, the type of sensor and its richness, for instance, and so on. And the law which rely the action you do with the, 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 the pen and uh, the way the, 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 the signal is captured, for instance, and so on. So, for us, the main point is to think the situation like that. That means an agent, something like an object, and uh, a technical mediation, and the possibility to act, and the possibility to have sensation. And we suggest that to to lead a scientific description of what is it perception, needs to consider all the, el all the elements, okay? And lead a, a science of perception is not just a description of what the mechanisms are in the agent, but implies all the elements in the loop. So actions are there, movements of the design, of the device, sorry, and sensations are variation of the simulation. And if we want to be a little bit more precise, in the sensory substitution situation, you have a double, double transduction, a transduction on the action side, when the people act on the mediation and the mediation which rely the action in the space and the space which transduce in, uh, on, uh, through the camera, for instance, and the camera which uh, transduces its signal, its signal on um, a natural capture, for instance, the skin. And you need all this, dev all this device to imagine the, the possibility to constitute a new ex perceptual experience of the world. What's O is an object? O, o is an object, but is, of course, the, 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 the perceived property of the object is, of course, determined by the property of the, all, the, all the loop. So, for instance, in this place, perhaps, um, 
there is a, a little insect and he has his experience of the world and you have your experience. And probably they are not the same because simply the, the way to be in the world are very different. Mediated, I, I, I suppose here you have a tool or an instrument and a, a sort of mediation. Okay. And here he is integrated, but it can be separate, for instance, the, the tablet with the stylus and uh, the possibility to uh, rest, uh, restitute the sensation by means of uh, tactile stimulation, for instance. So you talk about a particular kind of device. Yeah? I mean, when I see you now, yeah? When you see? When I see you now, that's perception. But that's not a mediated gesture. Mm, mediation can be, can be if conceived as, as a general concept. Of course, your, uh, mm, this mediation can be, um, can be, of course, a specific technology, but can be your uh, glasses, or can be a car, or can be a computer. And yeah. Okay, but of course, when this technology is used to perceive an object, perceive another person, who to perceive or interact with a, another uh, artificial agent, type of relation are, I think, different. And uh, So, in the tactile situation, the main points are that we have a coupling system which enables uh, a sort of haptic reading. More precisely, that is a pseudo-haptic reading, but the problem is that pseudo-haptic in, uh, in certain communities doesn't mean what I mean. Uh, but here, is, is it a pseudo-haptic? Because when you move the, the stylus on the graphic tablet, you have, of course, no resistance. Mm -hmm. Which is very, come on, delicious. Uh, smooth, very smooth. And when you cross the figure form, you have uh, a tactile uh, information, tactile signal. And, uh, the point uh, which is interesting in this situation is that you have to construct the resistance of the object, okay? So I indicate reading and dialogue because a big part of our job today, uh, uh, mainly led by Charles, is to, uh, Charles and John, is to uh, analyze the possibility to uh, organize the crossing of perception of two agents which manipulate a tactos uh, device. So the point is to enable an haptic reading and, haptic, uh, and a pseudo-haptic dialogue. So in this situation, the tactile flow constrains, of course, the exploratory movement, but and on, in a complementary way, the exploratory movement shapes the tactile flow. It's really important. And this situation, in this situation, we suggest that we have two, type, two types of mechanism. Mechanism of appropriation, which means the possibility to, to have the experience of out there. So the technology or the mediation is in your side or on your side. And learning is a, refer to all the possibility you have to be efficient in your uh, capacity to perceive an object. Okay? So you have a double movement which are not 
completely independent. The possibility to appropriate the mediation. So when you take the glass on your nose, you forget it. Okay? So they are on your side and you are in the world with the glass. And uh, the way you perceive the world is now different. And even if in the, with, the, with the example of, uh, of glass, uh, the phenomenon is not so massive, but you must learn to perceive with new glasses. Mm -hmm. So there is, with this type of technology, which transforms the possibility to do something, this situation implies an appropriation, but implies also a sort a form of learning to be efficient with this type of technology, new technology. So, in the tactos con context, the main part of uh, our um, work is to analyze, describe, model, and so on, uh, the what we call the perceptual strategy, okay? So the, the people are able to explore form and the learning is mainly dedicated to elaborate efficient strategy to, per, to perceive the form. And of course, the emergence of this type or another type of strategy depends mainly of the properties of the coupling. And for instance, when you have something like um, consider a, note, a simple outline line, and imagine that you have um, a receptor field of four pixels, for instance, and you move the, the, su the surface to perceive this line, the best strategy is to micro-oscillate around the outline and translate this micro-sweeping, micro okay? Because the main advantage is that you know permanently the side where you are, okay? Because if you have to develop a strategy related to this outline, you have to, to know permanently if you are on the, on, the, on the left or on the right side of the, of the, of the outline, okay? And you will try it, okay. And it's really funny to state that uh, when you um, consider the capacity to perceive in baby, or uh, in uh, kitten, uh, you observe the same type of pattern, which consists to oscillate around the outline to stabilize the perception of an event. Okay? And, oh, it's too long to describe the, the, the work, for instance, of um, Pierre Buisseret, uh, was demonstrate that the, um, the, in neuroscience, for instance, that the sensibility of orientation of sort, certain type of neurons uh, in the visual cortex uh, is obtained related to the movement in a certain plane. Uh, for instance, the, the kittens develop a sensibility to the verticality. If the ocular globe are the opportunity to produce orthogonal, so horizontal movement. Okay? So the, the possibility to feel or to constitute a sensibility to a certain orientation implies to have uh, the opportunity to produce a movement which is orthogonal to this orientation. Okay? And in tactos, we observe the same thing. And of course, but it's too long to develop, uh, a, 
a fundamental uh, skill, perhaps. And my first talk uh, I've sent to Marek was on this question, but I've decided to mm, not to present today. But uh, I consider, uh, we suggest that um, perhaps one of the most uh, fundamental skill is the, the skill which, is, which um, permit to manage the reversibility uh, as a fundamental law to stabilize a point in the space. Okay. Of course, when you enrich, for instance, the possibility to capture information, uh, if you have now not just uh, uh, a little uh, receptor field, but if you have something like a matrix, and the possibility to have the benefit of a sort of parallelism in the sensor. Of course, you have the benefit of the increasing of the surface, but mainly you have the benefit of the distribution of sensation as in your retina. You have the benefit of the big parallelism in the sensor. Okay? And our idea here is to consider, for instance, that this parallelism is not just more information per unit of time, but the possibility to synthesize movement. Okay? So when you benefit, uh, when, when you have the benefit of uh, parallelism, you are able to produce strategy which consists to follow the contour. Okay? And it's because you have this structure and it's because you can manipulate this structure that this new strategy emerges. Okay? You can try to do uh, the following of the control with when you have a sample receptor fields, but it's very difficult and almost impossible. Okay? And in this case, you have the possibility to know when you leave the control and manage your comment tu as traduit ça John l'accrochage okay thank you and our idea is to suggest that this matrix is is something like a mosh, uh, a micro swipe micro sweeping but inscribed in the the property of the sensor okay it's an, another way to interpret the status of parallelism of the sensor. Okay? And as you can see here, people and uh, here, uh, young uh, adolescents who have uh, learned to use tactos uh, during several months are able to follow the contour and have the experience of the form. Okay? More precisely, than when you have to use uh, a more simple uh, receptive field. Okay? But it's possible, like in the previous situation, to have the experience of the form, but of course we have evidence in uh, several experiments that, of course, the precision of the perception is increasing in this situation when you have the opportunity to uh, follow precisely the contour. So, about the strategy, we can say that we have uh, the first stages which consist to making contact and localize the contour. Okay, so you have a sort of mi macro sweeping. When you when you, you make the contact, you, uh, you can produce a reading strategy, which can vary, of course, uh, in function of uh, the property of the loop. And after a certain stage, you can observe some anticipatory strategy. Uh, that means the subject begins to uh, explore just parts of the contour to 
identify forms, for instance, or focalize uh, their exploration or remarkable property like uh, angle, for instance, or focalization on non-figurative property, uh, for instance, to discriminate uh, ellipse versus circle and are able to uh, imagine and localize uh, the center uh, of the form uh, to, uh, to make the distinction. So, the point is, is to consider that at the end, produce this type of strategy consists to satisfy a prescriptive constraint, identify a form, for instance, and based on this constraint, you can uh, appreciate and count a plurality of action strategies. And we suggest that we have three, three, three regi register uh, of um, three type of production. Of course, the, the most evident is the emergent production. The subject alone produced and try uh, reading strategy. But we have also uh, observed when uh, when the learning is collective, we observe socially suggested production. So the, um, the people share the possibility to explore the form. And uh, the last one is uh, the idea that uh, uh, when, you, when you do um, uh, uh, work in the, the modeling, uh, synthetical modeling, in, uh, to uh, suggest a strategy. Uh, the idea is to uh, show that uh, people doesn't think or uh, doesn't produce spontaneously some strategy and the formal approach can be suggested and we uh, state that the people are able to habilitate, habilitate this new uh, form of exploration. So, to come back on uh, Craig's suggestion, uh, tactile skill, if we try to define like that, that's, that is not just, of course, uh, an overt behavior. Uh, even uh, the subject, uh, even if uh, they have to produce a specific strategy to explore the form, they have to produce this exploration to perceive to the ge geometrical object. They can categorize, identify, uh, label, and so on, okay? Of course, I suggest this skill is clearly not innate because this pseudo-haptic perception uh, makes possible the perception of the distal object based on a proximal uh, solicitation of the capture. The repetition is needed. We have never met, uh, we have never met a subject who are able to perceive directly uh, with tactos. Automatization is, clear, is also clearly possible. We have a subject who are after mm, 10 or 20 hours of uh, using, uh, are able to produce spontaneously the, the strategy to explore the form. And uh, the, we are sure that the retrieval is easy and reliable because we have uh, proposed to reuse the system after one or two years and quasi immediately the people are able to produce the, the good strategy they have learned previously. So, in this context, perceiving can be defined as something like morphogenetic processes. So, we have to produce a gesture which, which informs the, the flow. 
So it can be defined as a morphogenetic processes of the cognitive phenomenological flow, which emerge through the activity of the dynamical cycle structure organization. So what we call coupling. So pursuing thus a relational act, which make it possible to posit that first perceptual experience can be that of an object at a distance, and in this case, we suggest that, of course, we have just one word, the word which is outside, okay? In line with, with uh, what I've said, the perceived properties of that same object result from the possibilities and constraints specific to that relation. And the third point is, uh, more an hypothesis, my hypothesis, is that perceiving consists of kinesthetically experiencing the relation to the object. Because I suggest that perception, uh, sorry, that proprioception plays a critical role in, in this story, uh, but it's too long to develop this uh, idea. Uh, and Charles doesn't share this idea, but uh, we have a, a long war together about this question. Uh, I would like to, to say uh, a brief word um, about this point, is that uh, we frequently uh, present the TACTOS project as uh, the possibility to appropriate and learn at an individual level, but we have to consider that uh, if the people are able to, to leave the, the supplementation relation, uh, they are also able to uh, use uh, something like the health relation, which is a, another way to uh, lead the appropriation and the learning. And I suggest that uh, health relation and technology which, uh, which are associated with this type of relation are something uh, very complex, I think, because uh, this type of technology habilitates uh, a sort of reflexivity, uh, but uh, not in the traditional sense. Uh, that is a sort of reflexivity which, uh, for the agent, uh, highlights the, um, the possibility to act in the future. Okay? So, in the TACTOS project, the HELP system has different forms. Uh, of course, learning session, a manual, a tacticiel, which is a, um, a situation where the people uh, can try to develop their strategy. Analysis by an expert, for instance, of their trace and traces and suggestion for further evolution. Space for exchanges and source of inspiration, of course, uh, because uh, the idea of um, tactos has been inspired by the work of Paul Bakirita, but also by the work uh, dedicated to Optacon. Do you know Optacon? Mm. It's a technology which, uh, which, is, mm, which the use uh, permit the, um, the reading of, uh, of later, okay? And the reading of book writing in black. So, Appropriation and learning in the context of TACTOS um, implies the possibility to explore individually and uh, collectively in a certain manner. So about uh, the concept of learning now, as you know, uh, we can consider that there is there was big evolution in this idea and mainly if we consider uh, the learning as a mechanism and not uh, as a, if you consider its form or so on but the mechanism of learning okay? and as you know the first uh, scientific proposition of what learning means in the science, uh, in the scientific uh, uh, approach, 
was the, the proposition of, uh, of Pavlov, of course, mm -hmm. which considered that of the mechanism is mainly to constitute association, a link between two events inside the nervous system. And he used all, uses all his life to manipulate the factor which are, who are, which are critic uh, in the constitution of this link. The point I want to say about Pavlov is, is, is that um, if Pavlov has frequently presented his work as the possibility to constitute the link between um, the neutral event in the first time and the uh, unconditioned uh, event in the second time. Uh, he has frequently present this the constitution of the link as a passive phenomena. Mm -hmm. And I suggest that uh, even in the work of uh, Pavlov, we can consider that uh, in the conditioning he has uh, explored, you have uh, something like a circularity, because, of course, the, 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 the animal uh, consider one trial, but is inscribed in a succession of trial. Okay? And, of course, the succession of trial and the repetition mm -hmm, indicates something like uh, a, su a, su a succession of events which close the loop. And of course, the closure of the loop is more evident in the Skinner approach uh, of uh, learning. But the main second uh, approach uh, is clearly uh, evident in the cognitive, uh, cognitivist approach of cognition. And in this uh, approach, um, learning is mainly the constitution of, of a node of learning, of a node of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the way the, the, the various nodes are linked is not really uh, a preoccupation, a problem, but the, the point is the constitution of a node. And in the third paradigm, which is the, the connectionist paradigm, uh, the mechanism of learning is mainly uh, described as the constitution of an attractor in a network of connect co connected elements. So it's something like uh, a synthesis of the, f of the two previous uh, approach. And finally, I suggest that the fourth uh, the, the fourth proposition, which can be compatible according to the inaction approach, could be to su suggest that the, the mechanism of learning is something like the constitution of a structure of anticipation, but anticipation in a certain sense, and uh, I precise later. So, of course, the main point in this story is the question of feedback, mm -hmm. and as uh, Norbert Wiener has uh, pointed out, it is necessary to discriminate optimization which uh, comes on the question of common versus learning which related to the question of prediction, and he has uh, a clear uh, sentence about these points, which is that learning is a very complicated form of feedback and its influence is exerted not only on individual action, which means optimization, but also on the model of action. Okay? And this idea leads to suggest that learning implies a certain type of feedback. Okay? So, this idea is also present in the definition of Scott-Kelso, 
learning in non-linear uh, dynamical system approach, where the learning is the process of acquiring, acquiring skill. Uh, so it's a li little bit different than the definition of Craig, because when I read your definition, I see uh, a difference between uh, skill and learning, because skill is just a form of learning. And of course, I would like to know the other form for you. But we discuss perhaps this point later. And in the case of Scott Kelso, learning and acquiring skill is something similar. And he said that the ability to, to learn is a chief characteristic of living things. Perhaps on this point, he is uh, very, um, very near of the inactive approach, because in this inactive approach, the, the question of living system, of course, is very important. So a chief characteristic of living things, undoing the organism with a means to escape its limited built-in behavior, behavior repertoire. On this point, of course, is agree with you. And learning change is not just one thing, it changes the entire system. And on this point is very uh, similar to Wiener's suggestion just before. So we can propose here that learning to perceive is the mechanism of the constitution of a capacity to act, which rendered its power to perceive effective, as we have said, for instance, with the, in the situation, in the tacto situation. And the constitution of this capacity involves gestures and dialogues. And gestures and dialogues are deployed in the context of innovative dynamic structure. So we have to speak about these points previously. So learning consists of organizing the succession of action with respect to new currents of reaction signals. And I'm very happy to know that Chile speak about uh, sensory motor laws. <laughs> <laughs> and probably uh, you, are, uh, you are right, uh, if I well understand your summary. Um, but when I say learning consists of organizing the succession of action, I mean that the, the, the possibility of the agent to construct, construct it, its, master, its mastering of uh, the appearance of sensation based on the type of action it can produce. And at the end, learning amounts to constituting a structure of anticipation. So this structure of anticipation mobilizes a mode of prospecti prospective control. And this is a mode of regulation of autonomous action sensation coupling, which defines its own orientation and self-organized coupling, which define the intrinsic plasticity of this regulation. Because when we consider the question of learning, we have to overcome uh, one of Menon's paradox. Uh, the two uh, paradox uh, are the following. The first one is when you have to learn something, okay, but uh, what is it? And well, where I have to go to learn in which direction I have to go to learn the new skill. And Menon suggests that even if you find a way how do you know that is the right one? Okay, so it's real difficulty to think the question of orientation of an agent which learn. How he find his orientation related, re relatively to which he has to learn. It's not a, it's not simple system. <laughs> 
not a simple question. And the idea is that the morphogenetic orientation is intrinsic in the dynamics, so we don't hypothesize hypothes, um, a final cause. Mm -hmm. the, the becoming of the system is still based on its own activity, from its own point of view, on own situation. Mm -hmm. And the other aspect of the response is to consider that any schema can become anticipatory once it's constructed by what Piaget called extrapolation and recurrence. The idea is, uh, it's uh, in the, the book Biology and Cognizance, Biology and Knowledge. It's the, it's the translation, John, Biology and Knowledge? Okay, it's the, the most theoretical, uh, probably the most theoretical book of Jean Piaget. And it suggests that there are mechanisms which contribute to, uh, if, you, if you consider an agent, he is able to increase the surface, the temporal surface of the events, if you consider that it's the development. He is able to manage in the past, uh, in the future. He is able to manage a temporal surface which grows related to his capacity to engage and manage the, the effect of his own action in the, in the environment, okay? So, and of course, the third way to overcome of Menon paradoxes is to suggest, of course, uh, the relation of uh, help as a special condition for uh, reflection. So it's very near to the proposition of Charles, which suggests uh, to manage the question of uh, how I can uh, uh, avoid uh, the death, for instance. So help relation, I think it's a very, very interesting uh, relation on this point. So what is our situation? Hmm? So we can say that we are involved in the vital cycle. That's our situation at this moment for each of you. And of course, we permanently transform ourselves. And I've taken a beautiful, uh, I think, a beautiful sentence of Maturana which says that, I read it because I love it, as molecular systems, we are structure determined systems, and as structure determined systems, we are systems such that nothing external to us can specify what happened in us. Something external to us, impinging upon us, can only trigger in us structural changes determining our structural dynamics. Therefore, we human beings, as molecular living systems are structured determined systems, and all that applies to living systems as structured determined systems, I love the recursivity of the language, this for me that, <laughs> applies to us. Structural determinism is not an assumption, it's our condition of existence. Okay? So if we have, and this uh, sentence, these sentences, uh, uh, come from a paper which is dedicated to anticipation and when and where uh, Maturana says that anticipation doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Not, Not exist. Yeah. But I consider that it's possible to speak of, uh, about anticipation but in a certain sense, for instance in the sense of Piaget. That means from where you are you continue to be uh, able to manage a certain temporal surface. But your behavior is not uh, determined or oriented relate, relatively to uh, events in the future mm -hmm. because they don't exist. So in, 
this way, learning consists of an extension of the domain of determination. And in other words, as the constitution of a structure of anticipation, the question of the possibility to anticipate, of course, is critical. Uh, may, but anticipate um, from your own point of view, of course. And if you, of course, this impossibility of predicting would prevent this constitution. So we can also say that our situation consists as a permanent possibility of organizing our transformation, not only rehabilitation, but enabling a sort of auto-perturbation. Okay? And now I have to manage a difficult uh, question, which is a, a long debate with uh, John, uh, about the question related to the difference between ontogenesis and learning, and the problem of, of course, of acquisition. And as you understand very quickly, uh, John consider that learning and ontogenesis are finally not different. If I take my definition, I suggest that learning consists of the modulation of coupling by closure, giving rise to an evolution of the unit's own behaviors. But, and perhaps, John, you can translate your, or, or speak about the, the question of, um, of um, creod and, and phenocopy, and the example of the rosophilia. You are okay, or? No. Je t'avais averti, John. <laughs> C'est pas une surprise, hein? Thank you. 
have this sort of transition, you know, to delay the plot, uh, the conceptual suggestion they might have is that this distinction is not a total cut and dry at all. I mean, that the phenomenon is not very completely made. Okay. And finally, the suggestion of John is to consider something like uh, creodes, mm -hmm. concept of uh, Waddington. And if you Im imagine a, so a, sort of a sort of landscape and um, the possibility to go here or to go here, and if you are a, a specific perturbation at the good moment, the, the, uh, the solution can be different. Okay. And Creod is, is <coughs> no, 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 So learning could be something like a perturbation of the, the trajectory in the ontogeny in the ontogeny landscape. Okay. And if I consider innate and acquired behavior in uh, the tree of knowledge written by Maturana and Varela, uh, what I found what I find every time in the organisms of one species, certain structure develop independently of the peculiarities of their histories of interaction. It's said that those structures are genetically determined and that the behavior that they make possible is instinctive. But if the structure that make possible a certain behavior in members of one species develop only if their particular history of interaction is said that the structure are ontogenic and the behavior is learned. So, of course, uh, John is really according to this, in, in agreement with this type of definition. Mm -hmm. And I'm not surprised, of, of course. And in another part of the text, I, I, I read um, innate behavior and learned behavior are as behavior indistinguishable uh, in their nature and in their embodiment. The distinction lies in the history of the structures that make them possible. Okay, that's clear. And uh, John Seward is uh, right. So, uh, based face to this situation, I have to uh, discuss with John because my intuition is that the things are a little bit different. And I suggest to him to hypothesis and the first one is to to say that although it's necessary to act in order to learn not all actions give rise to learning so I suggest that learning is a specific form of action or more precisely coupling because plenty of form of action are not oriented to learning. Between the, the agent and the world, or between two agents, or... Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay? It's a general uh, proposition. Yeah, very general. The second one is to, to suggest that although learning is a transformation of activity, not all transformations are learning. I think it's a specific form of transformation. And of course, I suggest that, for instance, ontogeny is a form of transformation, but which is different of the learning transformation or the transformation linked to the learning. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. of course. Oh, in, in, he knows the response. Okay. Yeah. So, 
first agreements. Uh, the point is, I agree to overcome the, of course, the innate acquired opposition, and the idea that the material processes which take place in living organisms are neither inert nor chaotic, but on the contrary, they are self-organized dynamic system. Okay. And in line, autonomy and not heteronomy are probably uh, the main point in this uh, aspect. So, John has suggested the, the question of specific modification of onto ontogenesis, and I've suggested two types of response. Uh, the first one is the case of passive external perturbation nourishes, in fact, a conception, a conce a conception of learning as a subcategory of ontogenesis. This, but, sorry, is it representative of learning context, which implies a suspension. What I mean by suspension, um, I, I mean that in order to learn, it's, it seems that the agent has to, uh, measure, uh, to appreciate the novelty of the effect of, the, of his action. Um, in the 60s, uh, a behaviorist researcher, uh, his name is uh, Kamin, speak about the, the contemplation of a rat. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting because even in the rat and in, even in the artificial situation of the conditioning situation, the rat have a sort of appreciation of the novelty of the, the effect of his own action. Okay. And if this novelty and if the animal is keep in this uh, suspension, the learning and the conditioning in this case doesn't happen. Okay? So I think that uh, learning suppose a sort of uh, rupture in the flow of activity. And the second element is uh, one cannot escape from ontogenesis, which transforms perhaps permanently. By contrast, I suggest learning requires certain conditions and it can be start or stopped at any time. One does, a, one does not learn continually. It's a little bit the same idea. Uh, and suggest here that in order to learn, um, the characteristic of the coupling must be uh, specific. And probably, the, if we consider that learning uh, suppose the, the mastering of the coupling, uh, the, first stage of, the first stage of this mastering implies um, a sort of mastering of the engagement of the agent. Second point from the, the, the remark of John uh, is that learning is not an action. There is no control over learning. It happens or not. Mm. He speak about, for instance, uh, James, uh, about the, the possibility of consciousness we have related to our capacity to learn, for instance, to uh, le jonglage, je sais pas comment on dit, uh, comment on dit? Jungle. jungle. Uh, the, our capacity to jungle with two, 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 two piece of metal, for instance, mm -hmm. and James remarks that um, finally the people are able to learn this jungle without any attention to the way 
they learn to acquire this capacity to jungle. It's even worse. Sorry? It's even worse than that. Okay. 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 A little bit, perhaps. Okay. I agree. So, my my response to this point, because it's a difficult difficult point, uh, uh, is the following: is to consider that, uh, following remarks of Craig about the different stage on acquiring uh, a skill, uh, even in the situation where the learning is considered as implicit, the research revealed that even in this situation where the people have not the intention, have not the feeling of, and so on, even in this situation, the the learning is not devoid of consciousness attention. On the contrary, the people are have an attention, have a focusing of some aspect of the situation. So uh, that's a difficulty for me, John, <laughs> uh, because uh, probably uh, the remarks of Jane on this point is very uh, difficult to manage. And the second point, it's not so much a question of action as an overall dynamics, which make it possible to elaborate a typology of dynamic strategy. Uh, that means here that the, the question is um, finally to overcome your argument is to uh, change of scale. And it's considered that it's not the, um, um, the direct activity, but uh, the question of the constitution of a variety of uh, solution. Finally, on this question, I have to say that, I suggest to say that all the living spaces are not able to learn. And uh, perhaps we, we can continue the debate about the possibility of the bacteria. Uh, I think bacteria is not able to learn because I, I think... Um, sorry? Ah, okay, okay. But I think that we can consider more complex uh, animals which are not able to learn, I think, because they are not able to uh, create a breakthrough in, your, in their uh, development. We have to take an example. That's for a workshop also. Mm -hmm. Okay. And of course, learning has constraints. Uh, the, the asymptote of the curves, for instance, uh, reveal that all cannot be learned and uh, learning. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh, wait. But I, I have a last argument in the last diapositive. So back to skill acquisition. Uh, and I come back to the text of Craig, which uh, very honestly, uh, I, I, I think, you, you say that uh, after uh, 50 years <laughs> of uh, experimental psychology about skill, we mainly uh, consider two generalization, and I agree. First one is that uh, it's little bit, but it is. Uh, 
I am uh, an experimental uh, psychologist, so I, I respect your statement. Uh, practice leads to performance improvements that are dramatic early in practice and diminish with further practice. And the second one is that the transfer between tasks is a function of the degree of similarity between the two tasks. So if we consider back to tactile skill acquisition, curiously, we have never do the, the curve, the learning curve, because we are focused on the strategy, but we have probably in the future, uh, we take time to do it. But I think because we have uh, followed many subjects in the tactos acquisition, we can surely predict that the learning curve will be compatible with the first generalization. But we also can predict, and you insist this morning, about the, the inter-individual variability and the intra-individual variability, of course. Yeah. Um, of course, we also can predict differential effect uh, in the trajectory of the learning of skill, tactile skill. And the transfer between tasks would have to be a function of the degree of similarity between the two tasks. But in the case of tactile skill, what do we mean? And that's a question for me. What do we mean by the similarity of task? And so what, what is transfer in a dynamical view? And I think it's not so simple to have a response to this question. So back to tactile skills again. Skill and skill acquisition for me are the same thing. Skill is not a byproduct of skill acquisition. Skill continues to be an element of the dynamical process, but at a different time, and is possibly evolvable again. And understanding tactile skill cannot just be uh, limited to the agent. So, writing the story, the scientific story of the tactile skill emergence. As I said at the beginning of my talk, cannot be limited to what happens in the agent or at the level of the agent. We have to consider what uh, happens beyond the agent. Back to skill acquisition, very, of course, important point. Repetition appears as in the framework of Pavlov. <laughs> Repetition appears as a critical factor for automatization. And on this point, I have to say that in spite that some subjects have facilities for learning tactile skill, and as in the very classical conditioning, nobody can learn tactile skill in one trial. So repetition, of course, is a necessity. But for what? And of what? Hmm? Probably for routines and automatism and of engagement in the learning. Then, tactile skill learning is not just the eye mastering of an efficient strategy, which we, call, which we could call routine, but also an appropriation process, which concerns the automatism dimension of the learning which affect the transitivity of the agent consciousness. So we have, one, once again, two mechanisms in our situation. We have to consider two mechanisms, the appropriation and the learning. That is my last uh, slide. And I suggest open questions. Uh, the first one is what could be an ontogenesis without learning? That's a question for you, John. Imagine the becoming of a human which cannot have the opportunity to learn at 
any moment of his, of his life. Okay. And another question is, which could highlight the possibility of a distinction between uh, learning and ontogenesis is to identify possibly specific biological uh, mechanism for learning. For instance, uh, I, I suggest um, the comment c'est à chaque fois j'oublie le nom c'est the the non synaptic diffusion neurotransmission which is proposed by many neuroscientists to support learning activity non synaptic diffusion neurotransmission that is the possibility for one neuron to diffuse for ex for instance the oxygen nitric gas between uh, uh, to the um, to the um, the neurons who are uh, near near his, near of it and the last point is to suggest that learning certainly has a social dimension which we haven't sufficiently managed. A possible consequence of that learning and is that, sorry, is that learning and ontogenesis have not the same relations to what it precedes them. In line, ontogenesis could be definitively conceived as an autonomous process but the social dimension as an heteronomy, and I think it's what you suggest, John, could introduce a discontinuity. And in line, the learning could then have a special uh, regime of causality. That's the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thanks.